Welcome back to In The Midst. So today we are covering what is a Titus 2 woman part two. We have covered part one in a different video, different post. We did verses three through five. Those are the verses that I believe um, go directly to women. Um, verses one, two, and six are to the men. And it's a lot of the same commands. You know, God wants them to live holy, and all that stuff like us. There are some things that are different, but now we're going to start in verse 7, and we're going to go through 7 through 15. This really is not um, a lot of verses. It's not a really long passage, but there's a lot of truth in here, and that's one of the best things about the Word of God is in just a verse or two, God's given so much truth, examples, encouragement, everything, because He's God, and that's what he does. And the Bible is alive. That is why. This is not just some book that's outdated that somebody used to read and used to like and, and kind of worked, you know, a little bit for somebody. The Bible is still alive, and it is for all of us. So I hope you're reading your Bible. Today, um, we're going to start in verse 7, and I believe that verse 7 switches gears, and this gives instructions for all Christians, not just men or women, but we are going to take these and apply them to the Titus 2 woman, to what God has for us, wants us to be, the example we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to live. So the Bible says, in all things, showing thyself um, a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. That's the world we live. Everyone has something evil to say about another person. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. None of us are without excuse for salvation. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. How many times have you thought sin is just rampant and it's not a big deal and who can live right like this? God says we can. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Titus 2, verses 7 through 15, all taken from the King James Version of the Bible. Take this verse by verse. Verse 7. In all things, which means all, every area of our lives, we are to have a pattern of good works. And what are those good works? This is just part of daily life. This is who we are. So often I hear people say, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to be better. Um, I want to be a better mom, a better wife, a better Christian, friend, employee, daughter, sister, blah, blah, blah. And I get it. I get what you're saying. Um, we've all said it. We've all thought it. We're all trying. We all want to be better. But something that I feel like we miss is... That's all the same. Those aren't separated. You're not going to be a good wife and not be a good mom and a good Christian. You are a good Christian, which allows you to be a good mom, wife, friend, employee, etc. And how do we do that? Through our own strength? Not at all. It's by walking with the Lord. We have to stop trying in and of our own strength. It's all the Lord. How we get there, how we walk with him, how we do better is by being closer to him. It's yielding to him. It's following that still small voice. It's reading our Bible. You know, we don't know what God wants from us when we don't read the instruction manual. You know, God didn't give us the Bible just for us to be like, eh, whatever. The Bible is for us, for us to learn, for us to know him, for us to see the examples of saints and sinners alike from days gone by. We know this. And by the way, every saint was once a sinner. 
So the Bible isn't something that we can't relate to. God left it here because it's his word to us because he loves us and we can relate to it. And if you don't believe me, go read the Gospels and look at Peter a little bit. We can relate to Peter, right? Mm -hmm. But this is just who we are. You become this person. You're not mean and hateful and nasty at home and nice out in public. That's not you. That's being fake. That is, you know, putting on, you know, what's acceptable to be in public. And it's not really who you are. Who you are is who you are at home, around your family, in private, when no one else is there, when you think no one else is looking and listening. Those inner thoughts that you have constantly, judgmental thoughts, thoughts of resentment, discontentment, that's who you are. We have to let God transform us. And he talks in the scripture about renewing our mind, renewing our inner man, being transformed into the likeness of Christ. That is who you are. This is a whole. Okay, we can't take our Christianity and divide it up into little boxes and compartmentalize this and go, today, I'm going to pick the good mom box. And tomorrow, I'll pick the good wife box. And that, I believe, is why a lot of our marriages are struggling. We decide, maybe subconsciously, um, that we have to be a mom first. And if I'm not being a good mom, if I'm not putting all my efforts and energy into being a mom, then I'm not being a good mom and I'm failing and my kids are going to hate me. When you're being a good wife, when you're being a biblical, godly woman, you are being a biblical, godly wife. You are being a biblical, godly mom. They, you know, when we get these out of order and things aren't right, and we put God down here and our marriage down here and our kids are up here. That's when things are a mess. That's when your kids are going to grow up and they're like, you, we don't know how to be married. We don't know how to do all these things because you, you know, put all your time and energy into us and didn't really teach and train and get us to be independent and all these things. And worse, your husband is sitting there after 18, 20 years, the kids are gone and you have no idea who that man is. That's when most divorces occur is when the kids move out because we didn't spend those times, those years, being a Christian and a wife. We spent them being a mom. And the point of being a mom is to work yourself out of a job. Get the little young ones ready to leave the nest, right? I don't like it any more than you do, but that's what we're supposed to do. So all that to say, we don't separate these, okay? This is who we are to be. This is why God's given us his word, tells us how we are to be. When we focus on Christ first, when we keep him first, we put the Bible first, and we dig in and see who we are supposed to be according to this blessed book, everything else falls into place. You can't be a good mom and leave your spirituality undone. You're failing them in the area of spirituality. We have to keep that first. Doing something good or godly every now and then does not fit this description. It doesn't. This is not a pattern of good works. Patterns are habits, um, consistency. That's what this is. What are the good works that we're looking for? Verse 7 tells us. The first one is in the doctrine. We are to show uncorruptness. Doctrine is just beliefs and teaching. We try to make doctrine this big, you know, theological word that's only for the preachers and seminary or whatever. And it's not. It's a very simple word. This is just our beliefs and teachings. We are to show uncorruptness. This is to be pure in what you believe and what you teach. This is just to make sure everything aligns with scripture. Scripture is the benchmark. Scripture is the bar um, of standard by which we set everything else. This is to not be a false teacher. God has a lot to say about false teachers throughout his word. We must be sure we are not in that camp. Stick with scripture as it is written, not as what you want it to be or what someone else wants it to be. You know, if you go to some um, church event or activity or um, like a ladies conference or a marriage retreat or something hosted by, you know, someone big, someone that you know, and that person gets up there and starts teaching something completely contrary to what you believe, what they've always preached, something that you can clearly see is not in scripture because there's someone in the crowd that is different and they're preaching to that person to try to give them truth to validate them. 
that's not uncorruptness. That's false teaching. We do not twist scripture for the masses, for our sin, ourself. We are to keep scripture pure, <clears throat> holy, right, just, straight and narrow, all that stuff because God wrote it. And we're not out here trying to change God's word. Not supposed to be. Um, you know, Revelation talks a lot about adding to and taking from, and that's just not somewhere we want to be. Stick with scripture as it is written. We do not need a new interpretation or another modern explanation. God has given it to us just as he wants us to have it. We are to show gravity in our teachings. Gravity seems to be um, the law of gravity. We're held down. We are placed. We are firm. That is kind of the same thing. We are to be serious, thoughtful, keeping this a matter of importance. Um, if the Bible and a concept or two is important to you today and tomorrow, but not next week, and you're like, eh, it's, I mean, we're under grace, you know, I can do it. Um, that's not, that's not gravity. Do not get to a place where the word of God is no longer important to you. This is a very scary, dangerous place to be. We need to show sincerity in our teachings. This is teaching with honesty of mind, being sincere, pure, true, honest, really meaning what you're teaching. This is freedom from hypocrisy. What do we know about hypocrites and hypocrisy? The scribes and the Pharisees, and Jesus dealt pretty sternly with them. Teach what scripture says, even if others disagree. If you've been around this channel, my blog, or my Instagram a long time, you know there's lots of people that disagree with what I have to say, but that's okay. That's not, we're not going to change things. We're going to stick with Bible. Um, do not change your beliefs because someone disagrees with you. It's okay to be honest. Have, have those hard in-depth conversations. Look at what that person is saying. Look at scripture. We could be wrong. Okay, don't ever think I have my stance and I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Um, there could be something that you've misread. Maybe there's something that you believe and you believe it only because someone said it. It's not actually rooted in scripture and you don't really know what you believe. There's so many people leaving the church because they don't know what they believe. They have some good ideas, but when someone challenges that or presents them with a new idea, maybe even a false doctrine, they don't recognize it because they don't know what they believe. They don't know what the Bible says. This is why you get Baptists converting to Catholic and you get people leaving the church as a whole and people are all of a sudden saying, you know, I'm agnostic or whatever because they don't know the Bible. They don't know what they believe. When you're not firm and sure on those beliefs, you will be swayed with every wind of doctrine as the Bible warns. Next is sound speech that cannot be condemned. That's a lot. I mean, you can, there's a few words, a sentence or two that you can't even say in this time without it being called hate speech. And it's, they're wanting to make it a crime, okay? So, what do we do? You know, it's almost easier to not talk and, you know, watch what you post on social media. They're going to put you in Facebook jail. So, what do we do? How do we, how do we navigate through this? Well, this is how we are to teach. When we give the truth, the Holy Spirit does the rest. We are to give the truth in love, not in hate and anger and condemnation and all of that. Um, but the Holy Spirit is the one that brings that comfort and conviction. It's not our job to convict somebody. It's not our job to save somebody. We give the truth. We give love. We explain, give examples the best we can. Um, that's it. We continue to love that person. We continue to be a friend to that person. But we let the Holy Spirit do the rest of the work. Truth must be given. And it will, will have to be given in love so that the hearer will receive it. Speaking in a condemning, hateful, forceful way is not speech that cannot be condemned. Our speech is to always be seasoned with salt and grace acceptable to God. That is the verse in our home right now because... Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may, that ye may know how to, um, how to answer every man, Colossians 4, 6, um, because I have two tiny people in my home that are sinners, 
just like I am. And we need that reminder. We need that reminder of how we are supposed to talk. So that cannot be condemned. What does that mean? When we speak like this in a way that is Turin, the Shroud of Turin. When we speak in a way that is pleasing to God, that aligns with biblical truth, he takes care of the rest. So when we speak like this, those that are contrary to us, those that oppose God, don't believe what we believe, they, they become convicted by the Holy Spirit. They are convinced of the truth and have nothing negative to say of us. And even if they have something negative to say, their hearts are hardened, their eyes are blind, they are just absolutely not listening to what we have to say, um, what they say about us, that negative, doesn't stand. It, we are still blameless because we are right with God, and that's what we are supposed to be first, right with Him. Verses 9 through 10 deal with the servant master leadership. This can be applied to your job. Um, you know, it's... I know we think of servant master as in slaves and the slaves are being beat and the masters are terrible. People are being mistreated. That's not what we're talking about here. This um, really just deals with our attitude. Um, our attitude at work should be one of seeking to do our jobs completely, doing them well, doing them with a good attitude, doing them honestly. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 10 31, we are to be doing everything to the praise and honor and glory of God. Everything that we do. This is going to put us in a position of having a good testimony at work that honors the Lord. And someone is going to say something different about them. They don't ever complain about their job. They don't complain about, you know, when the boss says, hey, this isn't right. We got to do this again. And you just go, okay, what do you want me to change? Um, when you leave work and all of your work is done because you didn't spend an hour on TikTok on the clock. And that rhymed. <laughs> um, but too often we are taking personal time at work and we're on Facebook, we're on social media, we're on, um, you know, answering private emails and texting and, and all these things rather than doing our job. And then when the end of the day comes and we're not done and the boss says, hey, you need to stay over and get this done. We're like, no, it's fine. It's, it's four o'clock, five o'clock, I'm going home. If you would have worked diligently throughout the day, do you let your kids do that? When your kids are supposed to be doing homework or chores and they're off doing something else, do we just go, okay, no big deal? No, these are principles we are to be teaching them now. We are to do everything to the honor and glory of God. Verse 11, I feel like is pretty interesting. Like I said earlier, um, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation, uh, hath appeared, sorry, hath appeared to all men. Everyone has experienced the grace of God. Everyone. That's what the Bible says. We might not believe it. We can find that hard to believe. We can doubt if we've experienced the grace of God, but we have. You are breathing. God didn't have to give you another day. Um, it doesn't matter how bad things are. You don't have family, no one talks to you, you're looking for a job, you're about to lose everything, you have no money, and we can go, God's forgotten me. This isn't grace, this is misery. Um, but it's the grace of God that allows us to be able to read our Bible, that allows us to worship freely. We're living in America. With all of our problems, we're still pretty free. That's grace. Um, my kids are healthy, it's grace. My marriage is... Um, not shattered and broken. That's grace. My health is what it is. Um, that's grace. It could be worse, right? I have a phone where I can call my parents because they're both still on this earth. That's grace. So we too often take grace for granted and we just assume it's just life. It's always going to be this way and it's not. But it is by God's grace that we are saved through faith. Grace not only saves us, but as we see in verse 12, it also teaches us. What does grace teach? It teaches us how to live and what to look for. So next we see that we are to deny ungodliness. This is anything that is in opposition to God. It's pretty clear. Um, any sin, ungodly living, things that deny or disobey God, things that become first in our life and put God second or third. Um, 
we've made that our false little G God in our heart. And that is ungodliness as well. So we have to keep a check on these things. What are we putting first? What's important to us? I'm not going to give examples or I'll be, you know, ranting. So we're just, that's between you and the Lord. Next, we are to deny worldly lust. This is to deny the pleasure or desire we have in sinful behaviors. This is hard. This is something that is part of our flesh, our fallen nature. We will battle this forever um, until we get to heaven. And, but it's something that we can have victory over. Um, having the battle doesn't mean that we are in sin. When we give in to those lusts and we say, yes, sin is fun and yes, sin feels good. And yes, I would rather be in this sin. That is when we are in trouble. God wants us to grow spiritually and to learn to desire the things of God. This reminds me of Psalm 1 verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. If you're not in the word of God, you're not going to know the word of God. You're not going to want the word of God. You're not going to appreciate the word of God. Our desires will become godly desires if we allow God to work in our hearts. This is a choice. We must choose to walk with God um, or we're walking in our own flesh and fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Grace teaches us how to live. How are we supposed to live? Soberly. This is not just living free from being intoxicated with drugs and alcohol. This is living seriously, thoughtfully, not in extreme qualities of emotion not having control of your emotions, going from, you know, really high to really low. Everyone's walking on eggshells. No one knows what to do. Not talking about mental health, mental illness. Um, some of us just don't control our emotions and how we feel. That's how we feel. And everyone has to deal with it. And too bad, especially for us women, we like to use about five to seven days of the month and say, well, oh, well, it's not godly. That's not having control. That's not living um, soberly at all. Um, we see this command given again in verses 2 through 4 in chapter and verse 6 of Titus 2, but God does not stop there. He addresses this in 1 Peter 5, 8, um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, and 1 Timothy 3, 11. God is very serious about how we live, about us being sober, about us being aware, about us being um, serious, thoughtful, paying attention to what's going on around us paying attention to the spiritual warfare in our lives and in the lives of our children. It's everywhere. And it's small things to slowly desensitize us and them from what God says. There's lots of that in this present climate. I'm not going to hop on that um, soapbox. But God is serious about us living seriously and not as if spiritual things as Satan do not matter. That's where we become is... Satan doesn't matter. He's not that big of an enemy. I can handle it myself. Um, it's just bad luck. It's not spiritual warfare. And now we're not going to God. We're not in his word. We're not praying. We don't know what he says. And it just becomes a downward spiral from there. And then we are just knee deep in sin and we don't know how to get out. This idea of paying attention, being vigilant. Um, that's what 1 Peter 5, 8 talks about. But this is not saying that we can never relax, joke have fun, laugh. That's not, God talks a lot about joy and laughter and being merry. Okay. Um, we are just to be filled by the spirit, controlled by the spirit. This is how we begin to live out these verses. You can also read Acts 13, 52 and Ephesians 5, 8 for this. Um, this is a lot of it is just remembering what we find our entertainment in. So God's not saying that you can't you know, watch TV or read a book or joke and laugh and have social media and all that stuff. But if the things that we're laughing at are sin, wickedness, immorality, um, things that take God's name in vain, if that is the highlight of that joke and we laugh about it and we think, oh, that just made that so much funnier, we really need to look at where we are. That is not being sober vigilant. And that, that's really given the enemy an open door. But this is something that we just pass off as entertainment because we can separate, you know, entertainment in real life. Can we, though? Do we really understand what Satan's doing in our thoughts? We are to live righteously. This is just to be free from sin, guilt, um, to be morally right. This is not perfection. 
okay? We're never going to be perfect, but we are to be seeking to live as God wants us to. And when we sin, we are to confess it and forsake it and get it right with the Lord. Keeping short accounts, asking for him to help us not fall into that sin again. That's all it is. We are to live godly. This is living a life that reflects God to others. Having the qualities of God. This is completely opposite of the definition we read above for ungodly and worldly lusts. We are, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's how we do this. We cannot do this in our own power. When we know what God says, when we heed that conviction, when we hear pastors say something from the pulpit and we're like, oh, I, I battle with that. That's That was for me. Um, but we get up out of that pew, we walk out the door and we go, but I'm okay. That's, no, we're not. We have to treat sin as sin. The last phrase says, in this present world. Yes, Paul wrote this to Titus a long time ago. But yes, this is for us today in our present world. Because it's terrible. Okay? Um, but God is God. And God is still on the throne. And God is still able. And God still has all power. God wants us to live this way right now. In the midst of the sin, the chaos, the confusion, we can live godly. Not only can we live godly, we can raise godly children for the next generation. God did not put us here to allow us to live in this space and time for us to fail. You were not born when you were born by accident. You were not living in this time by accident. I hear lots of people say I was born 100 years too late. I get that. And sometimes I feel that way. Um, but that wasn't God's plan. And there is a purpose. There is a reason for you to be here right now. He wants us to live godly now with his help. Our lifestyle and our faithfulness to God may just be the thing that brings someone else to Jesus. When you aren't going with the flow, you aren't falling into all the norms of society, please stop. You aren't giving up and just saying, well, that's what people do. You know, someone else is going to see that. Not only is someone else going to see that, your kids are going to see that, your husband's going to see that, but God sees that. And there's blessings for obedience. We know that. God's grace should be producing godliness in us, not worldliness. If we are using God's grace as an excuse, a justification to sin and going, well, we're under grace, it's okay. Grace should not be creating worldliness in us. It is to create godliness. His grace is a gift and it's never, ever, ever uses permission to sin. That is using it in a way that's ungodly. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. Verse 13 says, looking for that blessed hope. This is to live in the joyful assurance that Jesus will return. That is our blessed hope. Is we're not always going to be here. The rapture is going to happen. The second coming is going to happen. That millennial reign is going to happen. Satan, hell, death, and the grave are going to be cast into hell forever. Never to bother us again. That's the blessed hope we get to live in right now. Just like we have eternal life right now. Our eternal life doesn't begin when we get to heaven. We're already living in it. That's what we get to enjoy. Looking is a present tense verb right now. We are to be looking. It is what we are to be actively doing. Living in hope and expectancy that Jesus will come back as he said. First Thessalonians chapter 4 is all about the return of the Lord and at the end it says to comfort one another with these words. We aren't to be scared of the rapture. We aren't to be scared of sorry. We aren't to be scared of his return of death of What's going to happen when this world is over? Okay, this is to be a comfort for us. His return is not the end of our lives. It's just the beginning of our lives in heaven with God for all eternity. Nothing is better than that. But knowing this truth, we are to live each day sharing God's word so that others can know that. They can know. Maybe there's someone that is saved, but they are just hopeless and down and everything looks terrible. But we get to remind them that heaven is coming. It is only going to get better from here. We are going to see our Savior face to face one day. And if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. Um, no sin, no death, no tears. That is what we get to look forward to. We must share this with others before it is eternally too late. Verse 14. You do both worksheets. Verse 14 goes on to tell us what Christ has done in the life of every Christian. He has set us free. 
We've been redeemed by his blood and the finished work of the cross. We've been set apart. We should be different now from the lost people around us, different from the sinful society we're living in. We've been set on fire. This is that just overwhelming zeal. Do you remember when you first got saved and you were on fire for Christ? You were in church every time the doors were open. You were digging into your Bible. You were telling everyone that you got saved, that God is good, that they need to be in church, that hell is hot, heaven is real, and there's nothing else any more than Jesus. Do you remember that? When's the last time you did that? That's not something that God wants us to have for a little bit, and then it fades away and burns out like a fire left unattended. Where has that zeal gone? When... Um, when was the last time you told someone about heaven? It's time we stop suppressing what God is doing and has done for us and start telling others again. Verse 15 is a clear command to speak these things, to encourage others, to rebuke when necessary within the authority that we've been given, and to let no one condescend or speak badly of us and it be true. We can't control what they say. We can control whether it's true or not, though. Live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world through the help, leading, and power of the Holy Spirit. Remember the difference that this will make not only in your life, but in your home. If you choose to trust God and be a Titus 2 woman, lean on the Holy Spirit. Live soberly. Live righteously. Live with gravity and sincerity. Speak the truth. Teach your children the Word of God. Live that example to encourage your husband that we can be that family. We can raise our children this way. Your influence as a wife is exponentially large, okay? Use it for good. Use it to honor and glorify the Lord. So, until next time, stay in the Word, stay close to the shepherd, and let Him lead you in paths of righteousness.